Good morning. Welcome to the second of our St. Margaret's Meditations. The reading for today comes from John's Gospel, yeah, chapter 17, verses 1 to 11. It's called the Headed, the High Priestly Prayer. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all you have given to him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on air, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know the truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those who, whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and all yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me that they may be one, as we are one. That is the end of the reading. Very, very deep and very complex. A deep prayer. This section of John's Gospel is about the Last Supper. In it, John is remembering. Now, anamnesis is the Greek word, and it has the additional meaning of reliving the events, remembering them deeply. And I'm sure that John has done this many, many times over his long life. I've got to speculate now. If John was 17 when he was called by Jesus, and you could add two or three years to that if you like, but if John was 17 when he was called by Jesus, and as I say, this is pure speculation by me, but it would fit in with his relationship with Jesus, Jesus as it, he, he lay with his head on Jesus' breast. Um, it would suggest a sort of hero worship in a, in a young man. But it might not fit in with Jesus' charge to him from the cross to look after Mary, his mother. But if he was 17, at the start of Jesus' public ministry in about AD 27, and if this gospel was written in about AD 90, then he must have made, he must have been 80 when he wrote or dictated the gospel. And this fits in with the early church tradition, which has, has it that he lived to a good old age. I know the feeling. We may think that there was a sort of memory drift over the years here, and that the story would have varied as the years went by, but this was a Middle Eastern country where writing was not widespread, and where there was a strong oral tradition. Stories and agreements were passed down, and their veracity was held to be vital. They were remembered. And any deviation from the known narrative would not have been tolerated. John Wynne, 
and I were talking after a service, oh, it must have been ten years or so ago, about his experiences in Libya, where he was negotiating on behalf of GEC, for whom he worked. I remember that he was very impressed at how the Arabs took no notes at meetings, but at later meetings remembered very accurately what had been said and what had been agreed. And they would turn to him and say, as you will remember, John, well, John had to check his notes, only to find that they were always correct. When we discussed, when he, he discussed this with him, they said, why, why was it they made no notes? And they said, well, you know, traditionally, traditionally, we were a wandering tribal people and we travelled light. And they probably didn't write or read either. And how important it was that they remembered very accurately the inter and intra Famil familial agreements. This is what would have been, this is what it would have been like for the two Johns, actually, in Ephesus. And the words which have come down to us would be a very accurate uh, memory. His reflections and re-reflections would have remained vivid and unchanged. And what angst there must have been as he anamnesed, if there is such a word, uh, as he anamnesed um, uh, the events of his life, the events at the foot of the cross. And what, what did Mary, the mother of Jesus, tell him? What memories did he receive from her? So here we have very probably a very reliable um, and intimate witness um, whose memories would have been as vivid as the day that they were recorded, of the Last Supper and the prayer of Jesus in chapter 17 in our reading today. It was dubbed the High Priestly Prayer by early church fathers, and the name has stuck. The, open, the opening verse shows the intimate link between Jesus and the Father, and he further develops this by saying, that the Father granted him authority over all mankind, so that he, Jesus, could give eternal life to all. The next verse elaborates this by saying that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. There's no doubt about the relationship which Jesus defines in these lines. He's not just another prophet, as Muhammad said, he is, in quite a, he is in quite a different category. He is an intimate co-worker, co-spirit with God, the Father, the Mother. And we will come back to this in more detail on Trinity Sunday. Finally, in this section, when he is praying for himself, Jesus refers to the glory I had with you before the world began. And there's no doubt what he means there either. And it chimes in with the opening words of John's Gospel when it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. And this prayer for himself finishes with, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. No doubt about that statement either, is there? The next prayer, from verses 6 to 11, is for the disciples. And I can only use Jesus' own words here to the Father. And in them, you will hear him opening up his heart to the Father. And you can hear his anguish, anguish for himself and anguish for the apostles. I have revealed to you those whom you gave me out of the world. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And then I will remain in the world no longer. But they, the disciples, 
are still in the world and I am coming to you. And then, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name that you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. What passion, what compassion. These sayings are mind-blowing. And though they have been there for all to see, they have sort of been hidden in plain sight. And I cannot but believe that the attention of many Christians, including myself, has largely been elsewhere. Reflection upon them and taking them to heart cannot but change our whole attitude towards our faith and our life. Serious meditation on them must surely result in a, a sort of metanoia, a shedding of our old skins and the discovery of that new one which lies beneath, a reorientation. We can no longer paddle in the shallows. We would be drawn into the depths, the depths of the love of God. The cloud of unknowing, that medieval, med medieval, medieval English mystical treatise says, by love may God be gotten and holden, by thought never. And may we be able to sense the needs of others in the world and like Jesus, anguish with them and express that anguish openly in our prayer. And may they, the people around us, be able to see in us that love which the world does not understand. Amen. Our next St Margaret's reflection will be held on the date of our next family service, which is on the Sunday after Trinity. Trinity is on the 7th of June, and so our next reflection will be on the 14th of June. Until then, keep well. Goodbye.